Hello and welcome to the Kryptonaut Podcast. I am Mark Stores, and with me as always is... Kraya. And... Rob Morphy. Thank y'all so very much for joining us, the Instas and the Twitters and the Facebooks. Check us out there. Thank you to everyone that gets a hold of us. You are helping us kill time in quarantine, and we appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Totes. That's it. <laughs> we got a, mm, <laughs> I know the super on. He's like he's unenthused squared. You all right, I know, Chris? Everything, I, everything yeah, all no, right? I'm great. I'm I'm all fucking right. fantastic. Ha! I had to. Rob and I had to have like a little pre-talk. He had to get me out of my down and down in the dumps. We had to have like a half hour sesh. I'm just like, dude, everything sucks. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Therapy with Uncle Rob. Yeah, but I also started drinking too, so that fucking helps a little bit. Oh, yeah. so um, uh, yeah, Heller Space, HellerSpace dot com. Uh, we have the new uh, Masters of Reality Black Sabbath. Uh, I'm sorry, Master of Reality, as Chris corrected me last week. Uh, Black Sabbath. Uh, Knock off if you want. Uh, that's there. Check that out. Thank you to everyone that's purchased that. When you get that shirt, send us pictures. We want to see you in that shirt. We want to see how that came out. Um, also, too, we have our charity Meals on Wheels, which I believe is going on for another uh, month or so. And that is the Heller Space from uh, Plan 9 from Heller Space and the Heller Space uh, Kiss Rip. So thank you to everyone supporting Mm. that. It is super dope. We appreciate it. Uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash Podcast. $1 is a shout out. $5 is a shout out and some bonus audio. And we have some shout outs to do. Robert, would you like to start it off? Sure thing. Let's go with Mike Payette. All right. I've got. Oh, we're going to just bounce back and forth. Sure. Well, shit. All right. You and I can do them. How's that? Sounds phenomenal. Okay, I have Sven. Oh, Sven. <laughs> nice. Letitia Barney. That is Letitia Barney. What up, Letitia? Actually, I was just uh, talking with her on Patreon. What's happening? Right on. Oh, uh, I totally missed my spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we just literally established how we're doing this. Yeah, no, we're dumb, and I'm trying to get drunk. So, uh, Jamie Miskell. It. Jamie Miskell. <laughs> Indeed. And let's round it up with uh, Craig Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Awesome. Mullins. And Perfect. all who sign up and all who have already signed up, again, you're fucking awesome. And we really appreciate thank y'all. it. Thank you all so very much for your contributions. We appreciate it. And obviously, thank you to all of our listeners. We appreciate you all. We hope everyone out there is doing good. Um, so real quick, um, sort of quarantine, sort of COVID um, related. Apparently, um, murder hornets are a thing. I don't know if you guys saw that or not. What is that? Yes. You know, I I saw a headline and I saw a picture and it was like murder hornets coming to the U.S. And I was like, awesome, fucking dope. But then beneath that headline, I saw that uh, the esteemed, one of my favorites, Mr. Nicolas Cage, will be playing Joe Exotic in an upcoming feature. So you take the good (laughs) with the bad, I guess. Really? (laughs) No, that's all bad. That's all bad. That's all bad. But what the fuck is... Oh, all right. Do your tiger talk and then we'll get back to murder hornets because I don't know what's going I, on. I mean, murder hornets are a thing, man. They're apparently uh, some some they're actually pretty big. It's like giant hornet, I guess, that like attacks um, like it, it will kill like uh, like other bees and shit like honeybees like i said i didn't i just saw the headline i'm a consumer the media tells me what to fucking fear and i fear it so that's what i'm doing is i'm fearing fucking murder hornets but then i was like oh wait a minute nicholas cage as a uh, fucking joe exotic everything's all right everything's Criminals. good like i got real i got like real bummed out and then i got like super excited so i gotta tell you i wasted years of my fucking life being afraid of killer bees i read a book about it when i was like in late elementary school what a weird book to have in a fucking uh elementary school library and uh parochial school so maybe that fucking explains <laughs> yeah. something fear everything all the time and pray it away but uh yeah. i read about it and it was like by like the late 80s it was supposed to you know burgeon through texas and by the 90s we were all going to be piles of corpses it was going to be like stephen king's the stand with envenomation and fucking horrific bees that shit ended up being of nothing a fart in a windstorm i'm not saying that they've never been trouble and i certainly my sympathy goes to anyone that suffered at the stingers of these things but the big deal they were supposed to fucking be so it's going to take murder hornets to be pretty goddamn (laughs) special if you want me to start trembling at another bug infestation just imagine being in the newsroom and you're going over like all the different fucking the all, all, all the covid stuff and you're like wait a minute 
Rob, we've got murder hornets. And then you're like, run with it. <laughs> Make <laughs> it happen. It. <laughs> no, yeah. If I ran a newsroom, absolutely. It'd be fucking murder hornet updates on the hour, every hour. Totally. Totally. Chris, how do you feel about murder hornets? I mean, if they're here, then you got to deal with them. Uh, all right, pragmatic as ever, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris, how do you feel about Nicolas Cage being uh, Joe Exotic? I mean, I I'm not gonna watch it. It's pr- I'm glad I'm happy for you. Okay. But... Oh, hey, thank you. I That's appreciate true. that. I, I mean, like that I'm, someone's happy I'm glad for, me. for you. Okay. Oh, oh, you're glad. Okay. <laughs> nice. I, really right, well, yeah. I mean, they're basically synonyms. Yeah. 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 Chris, Chris is all right. It, it, look at. We're going to pull through with hopefully get past, you know, the COVID. Then we're going to deal with the murder hornets and then celebrate with fucking Nick Cage and Joe Exotic. So whatever. Yeah, no you know? I mean, unfortunately, there's probably not going to be a state fair. But hey, what do you know? Whatever. We can still go to fucking Pennsylvania and buy fireworks and get fucked up in my front yard and burn down, you know, my new addition. So there you go. Yo, so there it good? is. All right. Perfect. Oh, I'm there. Burning everything right. to the ground. Yeah, let's do it. Let's fucking do it. All right, this week we're talking about um, Killer from the Deep, the Pensacola Sea Serpent. Oh, so we're we're going to Florida. Since we've been doing this, uh, I've been dying to do this pod, actually. Um, And and since I've read about it as a kid in Tim Dinsdale's Leviathan, I managed to pick it up at a used bookstore, which is fucking obviously one of the greatest places in the world. I I lived for them now and then. And and it terrified me when I was young. And I've got to give a shout out to... uh, Adam Benedict, uh, author of Monsters in Print, you know, the one of the great researchers of our time, he uh, he sent me the uh, the actual Fate magazine uh, article, which I've been looking to track down for a while. And ironically, I got a book literally the next day, like two oh, days nice. later, called Mysteries and Monsters of the Sea, True Stories from the Files of Fate magazine, which I'll be oh. reading from tonight. That actually contained it as well. So we're going for two different sources here. Um, we've got the uh, original Fate magazine article, and we've got a follow-up letter written um by the the eyewitness to the the great monster hunter Tim Dinsdale, so I'm super super fucking excited about this. This is probably one of at least for my money most disturbing uh, cryptid encounters ever. So awesome! This should be pretty interesting. All right, cool. Well, let's get started with uh, in what may be the most terrifying encounter with an unknown denizen of the deep on record. A group of five Floridians came face to face with a mastodonic monstrosity that seemed hell bent on making a meal out of the group of teens who were skin diving in the Gulf of Mexico during the 1960s. Oh, we're going back to some skin diving. Yeah, the classic, you know, if it's yeah. not, uh, what was it? The mill, the mill lake, what? mill, the mill race monster. No, it's not the mill race monster. That's a different one. That's the one that had the monster hunt and it had the, the, the hobo in the costume running through the woods. Um, the one that basically looked like pickle Rick with big flippers and, and it was tied in with the orange eyes mythology. Yes, 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 yes. I skin completely diving. back skin, when I well, thought, you know, what? it was yeah. new diving because, you know, I'm a simple man and take things at face value. Well, let's, uh, let's go skin diving, boys. It's a little yes. bit cold, but let's 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 uh, this summer. Let's make a pact. We're going to skin, skin dive. Diving. Yeah, we're yeah, not going to totally. do that. It was okay, no, no way. probably not. No, yeah, no. <laughs> I do have a pool, though. So <laughs> Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris's only response. No, <laughs> <laughs> not going to. No, he's not doing it. All right, Bobby, bring us to Pensacola, Florida, please. (laughs) You got it, dude. The May 1965 edition of Fate magazine hit the newsstands as it always had with little fanfare outside of paranormal circles and without the benefit of a gloriously lurid cover illustration designed to entice readers into snagging a copy in order to read in wide-eyed wonder and occasionally gasp in horror at the ostensibly true phenomenon contained therein. Fate eschewed such sensationalistic tactics in favor of a simple palette of pastel pink and green combined with a table of contents for the articles within, which were tucked below a blurb that simply read, True Stories of the Strange and Unknown. Among the chapter headings that revealed that one could read your future in dominoes or (laughs) we doused for our home on a map was a (laughs) matter-of-fact title that read simply... My escape from a sea monster. 
I mean, with those titles, how could you not be uh, just enthralled? And I love how you have like two paragraphs of just describing the periodical. I think that's awesome. Thank you. It always blew I appreciate my mind. It. Your sarcasm aside, sir. No, I what, really do like it. I, I what, do. Uh, what blew my mind is that they always had that. It was always contents up front. They could have gone like <clears throat> astonishing stories or amazing legends or whatever these, I'm not getting the titles right, but whatever these classic sci-fi encounter uh, books had with these great paintings and they could have done all sorts of shit but it was never that fate magazine at least in maybe recently it's more graphically oriented but classic editions always just the table of content right on the cover and you Keep either wanted it up. or not so it was pretty dope nice one could be forgiven for presuming that this unremarkable heading might have been a dramatic exaggeration of an anomalous animal sighting that took place from the safety of a large ship but those who flipped to page 52 were greeted by the serious countenance of a 19-year-old pre-med student named Edward Brian McCleary. And the account he relayed regarding one chilling day and night at sea was anything but unremarkable. In fact, the story he had to tell may well be the most horrifying sea monster encounter on the books. And that's saying something, because there's a lot of fucked up shit that happens on the ocean. Fun, Here is the away account. From it, dude. Yeah, I know. Here is the account in McCleary's own words, written approximately three years following the disturbing events in question. So basically, how I'm going to do this is just regale the listeners uh, with the actual fate article, which was written by McCleary. And then when we occasionally go off script, I'll, I'll let it be known. March 24, 1962, was a warm, beautiful Saturday. I was having my morning coffee when the telephone rang. It was Eric Rule, a skin diving companion, calling to ask me to go with him and some friends on a skin diving expedition off Pensacola, Florida. I agreed to go after checking the morning paper for information on the day's tides and weather. I had been living in Florida for about two years, and I enjoyed the diving most of all. Now, for the first time, I had a chance to dive around a sunken ship. Eric said we would dive around a sunken ship near Pensacola Bay. I had not seen the boat before, but I pictured its open passages with fish swimming in and out with moss-like growth hanging from the decks and the whole covered, in the whole of it, I should say, covered by the blue-green Gulf of Mexico. I collected my gear and walked out the front door, smelled the fresh, clear air of spring mixed with the salt spray from the ocean. There was not a cloud in the sky. The white sand ran for miles down the beach, reflecting the morning sun like a mirror. As I stood there with the sun warming my back and heating the morning, I knew that this was a perfect day for skin diving. Just so all pause. excited, skin all excited diving. about skin diving. Everyone's there. We're gonna all of us gonna go skin dive. We're gonna find the ship. It's gonna be picturesque, and then shit goes south. Shit always goes south. It's the Kryptonite it podcast. To. Shit goes south. <laughs> Nothing ever good happens. That's the deal. But I will say this: this is just. I'm not saying that there aren't phenomenal teenage writers out there. I know for a fact there are, but. I would not be surprised if this firsthand account might have been embellished a bit in terms of the flowery writing by a ghost writer, uh, you know, one of the one of the standard bearers of Fate magazine. I only say that because he, he's definitely painting a thorough picture, which is not what you usually get in straightforward eyewitness testimony. So okay. I don't necessarily think that they embellished the facts of the case, but I think maybe it got flowered up a little. Maybe not, right, but well, I'm just throwing that you know, out there. Whatever. Sometimes you just got to, you know, you got to fluff it up a little bit. That's all. Just give it a little oomph, you know. You know how it is. Oomph. Yeah, totally. You just described an entire periodical in the first two paragraphs. So, yeah, you just got to fucking, you got to bring it. Fucking oh, wow. bring that shit. All right. So, yeah. dick move. That's what happens <laughs> when uh, feelings are put on the line and someone wants to describe <laughs> something for friends and they just get fucking hung out to dry for it. So, that's great. No, I guess I'm not going to be pissy the rest of this whole pod. I will, will I? make it. I will make it up to you when we go skin diving this summer. So there you go. <laughs> Fair <laughs> All right. Enough. Chris won't come. He'll just be on. He'll just stand on the shore going. I don't want to go skin diving. You know, diving. I'm not going to be there. Be like, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to make the. I'm going to make no, the. No, tell me about it later. Like, no, all right, fine. You're going to call fine. me anyway and be like, dude, fuck. <laughs> That's exactly what I do when I like, do pretty fuck. much. <laughs> Oh, continue, Robert. Okay, so this is 
this is going to be me describing the people involved because I want to make sure everyone knows what's going on. And then when we get back to the article, I'll let you know. Moments later, a dilapidated Ford pulled into the driveway of the home of the 16-year-old Edward McCleary. He was 16 when the event happened, 19 when he was writing about it for Fate. In the driver's seat was 16-year-old Eric Rule, and accompanying him were Warren Soleil, 17, Larry Bill, 15, and the youngest of the group, 14-year-old Bradford Rice. McCleary climbed into the vehicle and was informed that the ship they would be diving on was the USS Massachusetts, a decommissioned battleship deliberately scuttled by the U.S. Navy in January of 1921. The wreck site remains popular with scuba divers to this day. McCleary continued his account, and now I'm going to go back to his firsthand account. We drove off toward Pensacola and the sunken ship called the Massachusetts. The boys told me it was on a sandbar about two miles off the coast. We had a seven-foot Air Force raft tied to the top of the car. It had a drift anchor, pockets for provisions, and oars. We planned to use it to get back and forth to the ship. It was a little over half an hour I'm sorry, in a little over half an hour, we arrived at Fort Pickens State Park. The park is right across the bay from Pensacola and was a gun installation during the Civil War. The Massachusetts lay just off the coast. We climbed the three stories of the main embattlement, a long rectangular structure with a square brick tower on top, on top of which is a mounted telescope. Through the telescope, I scanned the horizon and finally saw a box-like object sticking up out of the water just off the coast, the Massachusetts. No, they found the boat. They found, well, through the, through the, uh, I scope. The scale. Yeah. All right. Located. We changed into our suits, loaded all of our equipment into the raft and carried it down to the beach. I waded into the water, but came out quickly. It was very cold. We thrust the raft into the foam and cleared the small waves with ease. The water was calm. On the way out to the ship, we took turns paddling so no one would be tired for diving. When I was relieved, I sat back and lit a cigarette. It's Paul Malta. Oh, man. You know, when you're with your teenage buddies back in the 60s, smoke it up, Johnny. Dude, when you're getting ready to go skin diving, you got to bring a sweet pack of fucking Marbreds and just fucking crack one out and just, oh, just light that fucker like a sweet steak. Oh, just you, you your buddies, yeah. and Campbell taste Joe. Uh, a sweet I can, steak. I can taste that Marbred in my mouth right now. Oh, it's amazing. Well, now it's ASMR bullshit. I used to be, I used to be a smoker. I'm sorry. I, I, know, fucking, I, know. I still think about it. And I'm, like, I'm proud oh, of you God. for quitting. Thank you. A small wind was coming down from the north, cooling the air. Down in the water, I could see the beams of sunlight piercing the surface to plunge below and become lost in the green depths. I guessed the visibility at about 40 feet underwater. I thought I would stand the cold to get into that fascinating world. My daydream was interrupted by Larry. Hey, we're not going any place. When we took off, the ship was on our right. Now it's on the left. So paddle the other way, Eric said. It's nice. The fucking <laughs> pragmatic voice of reason. You got to make up for the drifts and tides. Somebody relieve me, Warren, Warren huffed. This water's rough. My arm's killing me. All right, Warren. Everyone's bitching. On. Everyone's fucking uh, the boat bitching. Carry your own weight. They're kids. In all fairness, they're kids. Are they? <laughs> Doesn't matter. The water had, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> in fact, become topped with small white caps, which lapped against the side of our raft. I shifted my attention from the water to the sky. The blue was now overshadowed by some gray clouds, which hid the sun and gave the water a dull blue color. The seagulls were skimming across the top of the waves toward shore. The salty breeze seemed stronger by the minute. Looks like we're not going to do much diving today. Storm's coming up. Looks like it anyhow. We'd better get back to shore, Warren said. Bitching, typically, like Warren does. I added that. (laughs) We spun the raft around and started paddling back to shore, which by now was a thin green strip in the north, harder to see each passing minute. Because Because of the wind, the waves were washing us into the bay channel, which extended out into the open sea. In an attempt to keep 
From being dragged into the open water, Eric and Warren and I jumped into the icy water and began kicking behind the raft. Larry and Brad took the oars, but the tide was too strong for us. We climbed back into the raft, shivering and cramped from the numbing cold. The waves were so high by this time, we had to hold on to the sides of the raft to stay upright. As the sky grew darker and small craft in the area began to desert the open water for safety in the port just entering the channel was a small chris craft now oh, what's a what's a chris craft i'm going to explain it a chris <laughs> craft is a small usually mahogany hauled <laughs> power boat manufactured by chris craft boats which was founded in 1881 by the brothers henry and christopher columbus smith so there you go. Okay. That's a Chris Craft. All right, craft. so, like, is Chris our own little version of a Chris Craft? No. He's not. No, he's not our little <laughs> boat builder. That's, that's not. He's just not even reacting. He doesn't even care. No, he's dead to the world. What he is really wrong? Is. He's like, I am not a small mahogany boat, Mark. Thank you. Good you day, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Let's imagine what I just imagine, Chris. Good day, sir. And he just walks away. Think I'm a mahogany boat. How dare you? Yeah, but the <sighs> thing is, I'm picturing him as a mahogany boat with glasses no, and a me, winter hat walking away solidly. Too. Yeah, right. An actual craft. <laughs> Oh God! And just recently, actually, uh, him, I did. I, Chris and I had to make a, our our Walmart run, and he was chastising people in his, his complex for being outside and having a party during the pandemic. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> We literally drove by. We're in my truck, which is not a small truck. I got a big truck. I got a you do. Dodge Ram Bighorn. So we drive by, and Chris literally has his head out the window. And he goes, yeah, weather's nice. The virus must be gone. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking died. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, yeah, It wasn't him. that loud. <laughs> It was, dude. It was pretty loud. I mean, oh. right, I screamed for I screamed for dramatic effect, but you you've got to be there, Dick. Sometimes you got to passive aggressive your dumb fuck neighbors. You have it to. Was hilarious, yeah, I mean, dude. I seriously just looked over. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> anyway, continuing on with our small mahogany craft. Yeah, I know. We're, at the, we're, we're things are getting a little dangerous. The storm's coming, and we yeah, of course break know, down whatever. the tension as always. You have to. You got to bring it down. Exactly. We thought it would be our last chance to get to shore safely, so we all stood up and yelled "Mayday." It was difficult to yell wave and keep our balance at the same time. On the deck of the boat was an elderly woman. At first she didn't notice us, then she glanced in our direction and waved. We're saved, she's seen us. Hey, over here, mayday, mayday, we yelled. The boat did not veer from its course. Ah, she just waved. Yeah. <laughs> she's she's like, hey boys. what's up? <laughs> hey. Mayday, hey, hey guys. <laughs> Hello boys, good luck not dying. <laughs> Brad grabbed the shark gun, tied Whoa! his red shirt around the tip, unhooked the line, and fired it directly at the boat. <laughs> he's 14, and he's badass. I mean, you got to do it. Got to do what you got to do. If, if Chris was there, he would have totally already fired the shark gun. Yeah, if <laughs> we're going like, down, that, you're gun? going down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's awesome. The kick from the gun knocked him over and the raft almost overturned. The spear hurled through the damp air and landed about 50 feet short of the boat. It was impossible for anybody to miss the distress signal, but the boat creased into the channel, headed back to port. We're lost, those damn fools. We're lost and we'll drown, Larry wailed. Look, we're not lost yet. There's a buoy over there. I pointed into the channel a mile distant. We'll tie onto it with the drag anchor as we go by. We'll be okay. No reason to get shook up. Wow, uh -oh, shook starting, up. That's a phrase. It's starting, to, it's starting to fall apart now. This is how it happens. <laughs> we tried to paddle to the buoy. The waves were beginning to swamp the raft. Only the inflatable sides kept us afloat. The five of us were sitting, numb from the cold, in a pool of icy brine. At last we came to the buoy, we were in for a shock. A massive edifice of steel loomed above us like an angry giant. Its worn chipped red paint contrasted with the black sky. It was covered in seaweed from top to bottom. As the waves lifted it from its mooring, a great riptide was formed at the bottom. The water foamed, gurgled, and was sucked underneath the metal monster. 
All 20 feet of it looked down on us as I stood up and hurled the anchor at the buoy like a lasso. But before the line had a chance to reach, the buoy raft was caught. I'm sorry. But before the line had a chance to reach the buoy, the raft was caught in the undertow and dragged right for the bottom of it. It was going downhill like a roller coaster. Jump, I yelled, and just in time, as the last man hit the water, the whole thing came down full force, on, full force on the raft, dragging it under. I surfaced, spitting water and gasping for breath. Over here, the raft came up over here, Warren yelled. Eric and I were the first to reach it. We got everything out and threw it overboard. We turned the raft over and managed to get most of the water out. The rest climbed back in. We clung to the sides. The rain began to lash down like icy needles. The sky was black as night. Just as we left the channel, we were dragged past the ship where we intended to dive. So they're actually getting dragged past the shipwreck yeah. of the Massachusetts. The Man, wheelhouse, is... which stuck out of the water, was being battered by the waves. The wind roared through the open windows of the bridge, making noises like the wail of sirens. Back and forth, the cabin lunged, rocked by the mighty sea. Sometime later, I don't know how long, the sheets of rain became a fine mist. The sea subsided, tapering off finally to the calmness of a mountain lake. Out of nowhere, a thick fog rolled across the water, blanketing us in a stuffy, moist atmosphere of an uncovered, excuse me, undiscovered tomb. Not a wave rippled, not a fish broke the water, not a seagull called. Silence hung on the fog. Here, all right, so here's an interlude by me. It was at that moment that Brian McCleary became overwhelmed with a panic-laced fear that was more acute than any he had ever known before in his young life. But what he could not have imagined was that before the day was through, he would experience a seemingly ceaseless onslaught of soul-seizing horror that would mark him for the rest of his days. That's not fucking around, Scared. This is fucking around, Whoa. Scared. He yeah, thinks he's scared. For the rest of his days. He but continued his testimony. For the first time in my life, I was really scared. I was sitting there. I felt a big icy hand grab me around the chest and squeeze. My stomach froze. My heart skipped and cold chills ran down my legs. We were exhausted from fighting the storm and the present atmosphere made matters worse. Brad began to whimper. We're dead. We died in the storm. Oh God, why did it happen to me? So no, he, no. He, he, he thinks oh, he's dead. Oh, he thinks they're dead already. <laughs> yeah, right. no, Br yeah. Brad thinks he's fucking six cents in it, but he's 14 in all fairness. Yeah, but that's He's like, weed. it's fuck it, we're done, we died. We clearly yep. fucking died. No, no, <laughs> we're fine. Nothing to worry about. Calm down. We'll be back to land in a few hours. Eric tried to calm Brad. After quieting Brad, we tried to think what we could do. We decided we were helpless until the fog cleared and we could see where we were. Until then, we could only wait. The fog showed no sign of lifting. Visibility was limited to 25 feet. There wasn't a whisper of wind. I tried some small talk to break the tension. Eric, see if the cigarettes got wet, will you? There's still two packs, <laughs> nice and dry. The lighter works too. We're in luck. Yeah, dude, if you're going to go Smoking. down in a boat with your boys, fucking fire them up, spark yeah, them up. Yeah, exactly. Start ripping missiles immediately. We passed the cigarettes around and the tension seemed to subside. For some strange reason, we all spoke softly. We'd better get back soon. I've got a date tonight, Brad said. We all chuckled and felt a lot easier. But the conversation died down again and everyone was lost in his own thoughts. The water was unusually warm beneath us. Warm even for summer, and this was March. It would be during this moment of calm that an unusual sound broke the eerie silence of the surrounding sea. McCleary continued. Larry bolted upright saying, shh, I hear a boat or something. We all listened for the noise he had heard. The misty air became filled with the odor of dead fish. My stomach heaved and I gasped for breath. Just then, about 40 feet away, we heard a tremendous splash. The waves reached the raft and broke over the side. What the hell was that, Larry asked. Whatever it was, it wasn't any boat, that's for sure. It was at that moment that the boys caught sight of something emerging from the salty miasma that would shake them to their core. McCleary described the moment. 
Again, we heard the splash, and now through the fog, we could make out what looked like a telephone pole. It was about 10 feet in height with a bulb on top. It stood erect for a moment and then bent in the middle and dove under. The sickening odor filled the air. I've never seen anything like that in my life. What do you think it was? I whispered. Maybe an oar fish? I've heard they look like snakes, Warren answered. Oar fish don't stand straight up, Brad said. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe it's a sea monster, I suggested. <laughs> oh, no. See, you fucking willed it into existence. I know. He you told it. Just, he clearly you told it. Should have fucking, dude, if the magic cave has taught us anything, stick with the fucking oar fish. Jesus Christ. They had the rare vertical oar fish, which would have gently given them skittles and cuddled them until they were safe. They wished the monster. You get two wishes. Yes, Always. Everyone looked at me in silence. We'd all been thinking the same thing. I was just the first to say it. The silence was broken once again by something out in the fog. I could only describe it as a high-pitched whine. It appeared several more times getting closer to the raft each succeeding time. We panicked. All five of us put our put on our fins and dove into the water. Okay, so I'm going to stop it what, here what, because that's right, fucked. So... so- why did they dive into the water? Exactly. Whatever and this thing is, is in the water. So why are you going in the water with it? Or am I just not making sense? No, you make perfect yeah. sense. I think I think we'd all ask that same question. So here's how I address it. And there is some semblance, well, we'll get to, of an explanation. At this point, many who read this account, and likely many who are listening now, wondered what the fuck were they thinking? As dubious a defense as a rubber raft may have been, it seems far preferable to the alternative of being submerged next to a potentially sinister serpentine monstrosity of unknown origin and intentions. So here's where I'm going to jump to uh, the other book that is our source. A few years later, McCleary would attempt to answer this question in a letter he wrote in response to inquiries made by legendary Loch Ness monster hunter, author, and photographer, Tim Dinsdale. In this correspondence, which was published in Dinsdale's 1966 treatise on marine monsters, Leviathan, which is an excellent book, though I would say to our listeners, if you're going to pick it up, get Monster Hunt. That was a book he wrote 10 years later that contains all of Leviathan and has actually more content. It might even be cheaper because it's newer. So that aside, that's the one you pick up. McCleary attempted to explain why he and his friends had made what seemed to many to be a rash and rather unsound judgment in the face of this unknown danger claiming. Many people at this point do not understand why we abandoned the craft. Yeah, no shit. What happened to us is we became terror stricken in an open raft in a March fog miles from the coast with an unknown terror lurking near us. The wisest thing to do would have been to stay in the raft, but we were too terrified to think clearly. Now that I am safe, I still wonder if I should have stayed. Dinsdale would elaborate. This fact may help to explain the abandonment of the craft because expert skin divers are not afraid of the water and with fins can cover distances quickly. And the reaction to mortal fear can, in my own experience, result in an almost uncontrollable desire to escape. So that's something that the readers of Fate magazine didn't have privy to because this happened some years later and was published in a book that maybe some knew about and others didn't. But that is by way of an explanation for why they fucking did something that seems patently ludicrous all right Uh, well yeah (sighs) okay no i I mean i still i don't get that i don't get it at all no you're right to not get it because i uh, (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean you know what we're not there i guess that's the thing we're not there maybe if we were maybe we all three would do the same thing maybe i would oh, do it no. and you guys would be like mark you're fucking dumb you're well, fucking first all, the three of us would never be in a boat in the ocean much less a fucking inflatable raft that's you just don't you know no. that what if we're on a cruise if we were on a cruise ship no. and then the only available <laughs> rescue craft was a fucking small inflatable air force thing then maybe but that would be one of the very few circumstances I, I mean, think if it was a legitimate just, boat, we'd be on it, but not. You're li- you are you are limiting you are limiting you are putting a limit on our friendship experience, and I don't appreciate that. All I right. want to think that someday we'll be in a boat together. The depth of our friendship 
notwithstanding, and I think it's substantial, I would be reticent to do that with anybody, much less an inflatable fucking raft. As a fat bastard, you learn to trust only certain types of boats. And a fucking Fine. inflatable raft and or a fucking canoe are not two that I fucking find that I have a, an agreeable bottom for. Fine, then Chris and I will go do it. Chris will not do it with you. That's clear. Mm. Chris yeah. and I will be drinking on the beach while you are yeah. all alone in a boat, maybe <laughs> jumping into the water at the first sign of trouble, but probably not. All right. All right. All right. So now yeah. that they're fucking in the water with the serpentine monstrosities who intentions have yet to be revealed, now what happens? <laughs> exactly. Whatever their motivation was, this split-second judgment on the part of these amateur divers would forever alter the course of their young lives. McCleary continued his report in fate. Patches of brown, crusty slime lay all over the surface. I began to swim and kick spasmodically. I felt a small current under the surface, and I hoped it would carry me in the direction of the shore. Keep together, stay behind me, and try for the ship, I yelled. Eric and I were swimming together. The rest were together behind us. We all made pretty good time at first. Our fear was indescribable. That's completely fucking understandable. In back of us, we could hear whatever it was splashing and making that hissing sound. The fog was clearing some, and the water was becoming a bit rougher. Darkness was closing in. Oh, perfect combination. Little yep. less fog, great, but rougher waters and more darkness. The rain began once more, and the water was losing its warmth. I began to take long, slow, mechanical strokes to keep me afloat, for I was becoming cramped. Eric was still nearby. Every so often, he would call back to make sure the group was all right. I don't know how long it was before we heard a scream. It lasted maybe half a minute when I heard Warren call, Hey, help me! It's got Brad! It's got Brad! I've got to get out of here! His voice was abruptly cut off by a short cry. All right, that's it. That's, I don't even know. Yeah, that's you, the worst. This, you're, it's in the fog, you're swimming, one buddy screaming about another buddy, and then mid-fucking sentence, he's cut off. And you know that whatever's happening is horrible, but if at all possible, your mind is somehow making it fucking worse. Because you yeah. can't see it. But then again, if you could see it, I don't know how much worse it could be than a fucking sea monster eating your fucking friends, but it's, <laughs> that, it's tough. You're right. <laughs> Brad, Warren, hey, where is everybody? I yelled back at the top of my lungs. Larry now swam with Eric and me. Warren and Brad were nowhere in sight. The only sounds now were those of the sea and the lightning. I had an eerie feeling swimming in the storm, not knowing how many feet of ocean were beneath me. What was down there waiting for me? Oh, my God. This is exactly why if it is not fucking chlorinated and approximately six feet fucking deep, I will not swim in it. It is exactly yeah. this feeling because I, I couldn't imagine actually being in this situation. And I suppose reading this at a young age definitely made a mark on me, which is not to say I did not swim in the ocean and plenty of lakes after that. Because when I was young, I, you know, I gave less of a fuck and it was all good and well. And there were less brain eating amoebas and all sorts of <clears throat> fuck alls that are legit. <laughs> Seemingly less. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we knew about less. Let's put it that way. Less flesh eating bacteria yeah. to, you know, haunt us. But, uh, but this is exactly the thought I always had when I lost touch with the ground. Even though I know most shark attacks happen in shallower water, but de facto, that's like saying most car accidents happen near your home. It's just where you are the most frequently when these things might happen. But the idea of like just being out to the point in a lake even where it's murky and you don't know, it's just a terrifying yeah. feeling. But if two of your friends have just disappeared and you've seen a bulbous headed telephone pole, which we'll get a better <laughs> description of later, it's... Well, it's fucking worse. Well, yeah, and dude, you get automatic like icky toes when you have like ever had like a fish like just dodge your foot. Oh, like, so many times, oh. and just you get that weird like you try to you try to like run, jump out of the water, but like it's too deep and you just can't. Like, totally, dude. I, icky yeah, toes totally. is a perfect fucking descriptor. That is fucking exactly it. You feel that slimy thing brush past, and you're like, the fuck you are. The fuck you did? Why? Yep. Why is anything yeah. alive in this lake? I want everything to die in this lake right now. I want this lake Not to be good. crystal clear and dead. I want this a to be the sure, Dead Sea. A sure yep. sign of pollution. Not good. Yeah. I wanted to sink into the green silence. I felt all alone, peaceful, and quiet. 
It would have been so easy just to surrender to the sea, but something inside me kept going. The pain in my legs was like fire, but I kept up the mechanical strokes. I knew I had to keep going. When at last I realized where I was again, Larry was gone. Eric, what happened to Larry? He was here a minute ago. <laughs> Oh, no. You shouldn't have been daydreaming about fucking floating into the briny warmth of oblivion. Yeah. Fucking you, good yeah. job, Bry. Hey. Chris, Chris, <laughs> Chris, my mahogany craft. Where's Rob? Where'd Rob go? He's I don't just know, here. I think he's dead. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's, let's move on with our life. Chris what? just came Thank you. up. He's Thank like, you. yeah, Rob's dead. What a fine epitaph. What a great memorial you've just given me. Oh, Thank God. you so he's much. Like, and then he's like, guess what, Mark? You're next. I am not your mahogany craft. i got to tell you guys craft. one thing yeah. that I know for a fact right now. After my 36th ball salute at my funeral, <laughs> Chris is giving the speech. Yeah, oh. Rob. He's dead. He's dead. Let's get on with it. <laughs> Fire the ball. Kegs Let's, over here. Yep. Yeah. Let's go eat. It's the only way to move on. <laughs> Let's go eat. All right. Uh, there's a Zeta dinner over here. There's some chicken and potatoes if you'd like. Oh, Zeta and vegetable. death. They go hand in hand. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been do. to a memorial service that didn't have Zeta. I don't know if it's just easy to prepare or what, but now yeah, it, it might as well dude. all be in black because I don't even yeah. have it unless it's at a fucking funeral now yeah, or some family right. gathering. Right. Dude, you get a ziti. There's some complimentary bread, which you really, you know, and then you get the fucking salad and like maybe a mixed veggie, and then someone's got a cake, and you're like, oh yeah, diet soda. Oh, uh, so we're doing the Prince Grandma Edward died. medley for your funeral. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you he didn't bastards. like vegetables, so fuck him. <laughs> Definitely not that fucking medley. Christ to be. All right, <sighs> we're in the All sea. Right. A lot of suspense. <laughs> <laughs> we'll eat when I'm dead, okay? We'll right, eat when I'm dead. Right, well, okay. All right, calm down. You're screaming. Calm down. I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> all right, so, <laughs> Eric, what happened to Larry? <laughs> he was here a minute ago. <laughs> I don't know. He was just here. Both of us dove for him. We tried to see if we couldn't get him to the surface, but there was no trace of him. After a while, we had to give up. Then Eric grimaced and sank. I swam over and wrapped his arm around my neck. Cramps, he said. We swam like this for what must have been a couple of hours. I hoped we were going in the right direction. It was pitch dark. The waves were breaking on my head. My lungs were filled with salt water. I was ready to give up. Eric was becoming heavier by the minute, and I had no hope. Just as I was going under, the lightning flashed, and I saw the silhouette of the Massachusetts. I began to take stronger strokes. We were saved. Come on, Eric, I said. We'll be okay, boy. The ship's just over the next wave. I've got to keep up. Come on, baby, let's go. Oh. I cl I was clear. I know. The, the babies in the clothes. It was the 60s. Boys so and babies, come on. Yeah, I know. I cringe too. It's it's oh, uncomfortable. Come on, tiny baby but boy. Let's go. Friendship is different then. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Who's a little baby boy? Come on, little baby boy. <laughs> Fucking real quick, not to digress, but oh. is their friend dead? Like, are they not going to fucking attempt to find this dude? Dude, they did. They, they, like, they fucking Rob's into, gone. <laughs> the ocean is big. When, when they could not find Larry after multiple dives, they what choice did they have? You got to move on. They just like diving. Fuck Larry Bill. They said, fuck Larry Bill. We'll see you later. Wow, you remembered his last name. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, exactly. No, they Larry said, Bill. fuck Larry Bill. Exactly. They they fully Chris oh. him. They were like, hey, he's been gone for 38 <sighs> seconds. We have to get on with our lives. <laughs> if this you walk is, out of the we room, can't, we can't Chris thinks you're dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah all right. exactly. They had ZD to look forward to. There was ZD involved. Everybody yeah. in the world to fucking Chris is like Schrodinger's cat. As soon as they're fucking gone, <laughs> they're in a state that is neither alive nor dead. They just are in a semi-state of non-existence until they oh, come God. back in the fucking room. Yeah. All right. Continue on, please. Will do. They see the Massachusetts and come on, baby boy. 
It's ours. All right. I was close <laughs> to the ship when a giant wave pulled me under and yanked Eric's arm from around my neck. I came up and couldn't see him anywhere. Then lightning flashed and I saw him ahead of me. He was floating and swimming for the ship. Right next to Eric, that telephone pole-like figure broke the water. I could oh, see shit. the long neck and two small eyes. The mouth opened and it bent over. It dove on top of Eric, dragging him under. I screamed and began to swim past the ship. My insides were shaking uncontrollably. So, fucking Eric. Sad. <laughs> At this point, <laughs> sad. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's it sucks. You get to see it in in the letter he wrote to Dinsdale. So I'm switching books midstream here. This is this is live and exciting, and I've got a band aid in here as a bookmark. There's also an actual sketch he included. That's fucking um, disgusting. It's yeah. not. It's not a used. It's, it's not a used band aid. It's not like covered in fucking blood and scabs. It's fucking in a package. <sighs> I, I just had it, it around. Really? I think it is. <laughs> You're skeezed out by a fucking unopened Band-Aid. I sure can't. am. What can I do? What can I do with you? Let me find this fucking shit. Okay. So, I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under, that last friend being Eric, and this is his letter to Tim Dinsdale some years later. The neck was about 12 feet long, brownish green and smooth looking. The head was like that of a sea turtle, except more elongated with small teeth. And then in parentheses, I'm not positive of this. It looked as if there were teeth on the gums. I did not see any fins, although there appeared to be what looked like a dorsal fin when it dove under for the last time. Also, as best as I am able to recall, the eyes were green with oval pupils. So that's... Okay fucking pretty clear and it's a pretty disturbing image like an elongated sea turtle head so i imagine it's got like a little beak i don't know if it's a green sea turtle or what kind of sea turtle but the but an extended toothy because that's not how sea turtles work with a long greenish neck brownish neck it's, it's pretty icky i finally made it to the ship the top of which protruded from under the water. If you guys remember, like the boxy, uh, you know, bridge or whatever was sticking up. Yeah. And stayed there for most of the night. So I'm going to go back to the original Fate Magazine article, which again, I think Adam Benedict for. My insides were shaking uncontrollably. So as after a while, he he is forced to get back into the, the, the water because otherwise you know, he's just going to fucking die on this thing. The Massachusetts is two miles from shore, but I do not remember swimming this distance after Eric was killed. I thought I went down, down. I thought I rested on the soft, sandy bottom. Voices talked to me. I felt warm and secure. I was at peace. I knew I was dead. So, oddly enough, a lot of those descriptors... <laughs> oh, man. I know, first Brad and now him, but a lot of those descriptors are what people that have survived drowning tend to describe like once you've given up the struggle and your lungs are filled with what is no longer oxygen fucking you tend to have this wave of peace and calmness I, it must be like the brain releasing a fucking flood of oh yeah 100 or something into your brain to make you like have a slightly less horrible death why he felt like he experienced this and yet didn't die yet somehow managed and maybe he would just had a blackout maybe at this point it was mechanical swimming for brian because I mean, I don't know how you get back in the water. I think I probably, if I made it to the top of this thing, even though at 12 feet, the creature could come up and snag them right off, I probably would have laid there until I dehydrated and died. Because the thought of getting back in the water would be so antithetical to anything I would be able to imagine. It would be so utterly terrifying that I couldn't imagine doing it. Yeah, no, totally, totally. But anyway, as much as he thought he was dead... I couldn't believe it when I felt sand under my feet and the silence of my peaceful quote-unquote death was shattered by pounding surf. I was flung forward on my face and got a mouthful of sand. I tried to walk but kept falling to my knees. When I re Then I remembered I had my fins on. I threw them back into the water and headed up the beach. I tried to find help. I could see the lights of Pensacola in the distance, but I didn't know where I was. The cold night wind was making me shiver, so I looked for a warm place. I finally came to a tower of some sort. I climbed all the way up the ladder and passed out on the floor of the little cabin. 
I must have slept about two hours, but it seemed like two years. All night long, I kept hearing voices. I was awakened by the Sunday morning sun hitting my face through a window of the tower. I ached all over from the long swim. I got up and looked out the window across the white beach, across the calm gulf. The events of the previous day seemed like a bad dream. I headed for the ladder. My legs wouldn't support me, and I fell down the ladder to land face first down in the sand below. I was crawling across the sand when a group of boys came up to me. Say, mister, you must be one of the divers lost yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to get help. <laughs> How do you guys know okay. about the accident? <laughs> the Coast Guard found your raft this morning and began a search. I've got to get help. <laughs> Please. <laughs> hey, mister. Hey, one of those dead guys? You need one of them newspapers, Dan? Because we're like a paper boy from Brooklyn, 1942. Yeah, I, gonna, I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going for that, but sure, bring it there. Totally. Yeah, say, right. mister, what's going on hey, with mister. you? You look like you encountered a sea monster and barely survived. <laughs> wow. God. Wow. wow. All right, I apologize. <laughs> thank you thank you all of our friends in new york they are they are appreciative of that thank you oh yeah yeah the next thing i remember was waking up in the pensacola naval base hospital breakfast was in front of me but i couldn't eat because my throat was sore from the salt water the director of the search and rescue units came in to see me that morning <clears throat> director e.e e. mcgovern was a mild-mannered friendly southerner i remember him well because of his kind face i told him exactly what happened what i had witnessed did they find any of the others, I asked him. No, he replied. We've had planes out all morning, and I've see, and, and we've been combing the beaches, but we haven't found nothing yet. Do you believe no. me what happened and all, I asked? You know, son, he drawled. The sea has a lot of secrets. There are a lot of things we don't know about. People don't believe these things because they're afraid to. Yes, I believe you, but there's not much else I can do. He asked me some more questions, and then he left. Some reporters interviewed me later that day. After they had gone, I wondered if they really believed what had happened. I thought it must have happened because the boys were dead, and I knew that thing that got them was real. It is true, the sea has some terrible secrets, and now I know how she manages to keep them. So right now I'm going to get into the postscript, which is no longer uh, a first-hand account from Brian McCleary, but was included in the, the issue of Fate magazine. Both the Pensacola Journal and the Playground News of Fort Walton carried the stories of this tragedy. These stories do not match Brian McCleary's account of what the doctors at the Naval Hospital had to say. One report says Brian drifted and swam for more than two miles, but Coast Guard and Navy rescue units estimated he swam five miles. Doctors at the Naval base said he was in the water over 12 hours. Fucking wow. Okay. That's just nuts and terrible. That's the crazy. In, the interviewing reporters told Brian their stories would not mention the sea serpent as it was, quote unquote, better left unmentioned for all concerned. And while that seems sort of shady, I can get that. We're talking an era of journalism where the reporters that, you know, their beat was Washington, D.C. and the Oval Office kept mum about JFK's myriad affairs because you don't sully the president. Because, you know, it's none of your personal beeswax what this guy does when he's in his private time. These are, I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I, but journalism now is all about exposing everything to the maximum. And, and maybe that's for the best. But once upon a time, if shit it would hurt a lot of people, this kid's reputation, much less the families of all involved, and it wouldn't help them to know this. I could see where some local journalists might be like, especially back then yeah no well they fucking drown right some people find it dubious but I, i'm i'm less inclined to that the bodies of eric rule warren soleil larry and larry stewart bill were never recovered one body washed ashore a week after the accident and brian says to the best of my knowledge i identified that body as the, the body as that of brad rice now brad oh. rice apparently drowned so he did, was not inside the belly of a beast, quite literally, and therefore a, a carcass could wash up. Right. 
still tragic. The raft was found 10 miles from where Brian came out of the water. He was picked up near Fort McRae about 7.45 a.m. Sunday, March 5th, 1962, by a helicopter from the Naval Air Station. He spent the early morning hours in an old gun emplacement, so that's the tower he had crawled into and passed out in. The clipping further states Brian was suffering from shock and exposure, but was released to his parents after brief treatment in the Naval Hospital. Brian writes us that after the accident, he had a nervous breakdown, but recovered and was able to resume his life in about three months. That's fucking completely understandable. Sure. To succumb to like a huge bout of anxiety driven <clears throat> fucking madness, for lack of a better term. The fact that he recovered in three months is the astounding part as far as I'm concerned. Now, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of ways that you, you would like to follow this up. Uh, there was an article uh, in Crypto Mundo that talked about um, how he, he wouldn't talk about this Edward Brian McCleary in later years. And I get it because he probably got a lot of shit and coming clean like he did, even after uh, the reporters basically tried to give him an out. I'm sure he was haunted by this because they, you know, he they published it in Fate magazine, so it became one of the legendary stories ever published in that magazine for obvious reasons. Tim Dinsdale followed up directly, and he published it in his book. Um, but towards the end of his life, he would not concede to additional interviews, and he <clears throat> passed away um, February 24th, 2016. So now he's gone, and there's no way of really confirming. But one of the interesting things was the tact in that Crypto Mundo article was that um, that it was likely a hoax, which for many reasons, or at least a few, I disagree with. One is I can't see why this guy, if he had just survived a horrible outing out at sea where they were just sort of amateur divers and they didn't expect to get caught in a storm and fuck faces on the Chris craft left them to fucking drown because they don't know an SOS signal when they see one shot at them with this fucking shark gun. Yeah. Um, why would you make up a story of somebody eating its way through all of your best friends and then live with that if that didn't happen. Because he wasn't making yeah. bank from Fate magazine. Yeah, that seems like a weird hoax to pull. Like, oh my God, all my friends died in this tragic accident. Well, you know, one made it through, but um, I'm, I'm well, correct, right? None one, of his friends friend... made it through. He just made it through. Okay, so so he made it through. All of his friends um, are died. dead, and then he's going to turn it into a weird story. I mean, if it was something where, like, because of hypothermia or something, he was uh, hallucinating or just misidentifying something but it, it seems really fucked up like super fucked up that his friends are dead and, and then he's like oh, i'm gonna hoax a fucking you know pensacola sea serpent incident like it just doesn't seem to add up at all that's one of the reasons that i am inclined to think now i mean who the fuck knows what what happened but i'm inclined to think that that does it just doesn't smack of a properly thought out hoax if he had written a book because no. it was the heyday of like the paranormal uh you know paperbacks and he had made you know a little bundle off of selling his story or tried to stretch it out but no i mean whatever stipend he got from fate assuming he got anything at all um wouldn't have been enough to justify putting people through it and one of the interesting thing this is in the uh in the comments below the crypto Mundo article somebody um claiming to be the brother of larry bill was like no this this is not a hoax this shit happened and in another article i read um i'm, I'm horrible at citing i'll try to find where these are because my notes are all scattered around but um a, a pastor at a at a church in florida was uh, ministering to Larry Bill's mother where she told him not in a confessional private way, but just all about what had happened to her son and the tragedy and how a monster from the deep had taken him. So um, uncorroborated granted, but it seems like two sources from Larry Bill's family not only heard the sea monster version of the events, but believed them. Yeah. So, right. So that combined with the fact that if there's one fucking place in the world that is going to be littered, like literally infested with fucking potentially huge predators that are unidentified, it is the fucking yeah, ocean. Totally. It's Florida. Yeah, it is fucking Florida. The coasts of Florida. <laughs> just yes. Florida. Oh, many other totally. places everywhere else. Just Florida. Primarily like, just Florida. Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the um, toothy terror. Shout outs to all of our Florida listeners. You know who you are. What's up, Trina? How you doing? Um, so yeah, ah, God, that's just a weird thing to hoax. 
weird fucking thing. I'm, I'm not going to lie here, full disclosure. I did not get to read any of the story. I didn't know everyone died. Everyone died. I was kind of like, oh, they all made it back. No. And fucking, bah, bah, bah. Sad trumpet. Wrong. No, no, everyone died. That's fucking, I feel so fucking bad for this dude. That's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. That sucks. That, yeah. that sucks to live with. Oh, oh my God. I don't know how. I mean, he was in pre med. I don't think he became a doctor. I don't know what became of his life. He had children and a family. I hope it was a happy life. I can't imagine he ever got near the fucking ocean again. I, I mean, I read that story and it, to this day, thoughts of it haunt me whenever I'm near, uh, you know, a non chlorinated body of water. So I can't imagine what living through something like that. I think it really it, it stands for me as the scariest cryptozoological encounter I have ever come across. And we've dealt with some uh, in the podcast on Cryptopia back in American Monster Days. I've read scads of accounts, obviously. Some are freaky as fuck, but nothing to me is like 12 hours in a foggy, dark, opaque, murky ocean watching your friends get popped off one by one and screaming in terror while you're agonizingly mechanically, as he said over and over again, just trying to get to and don't even know if you're swimming further out to sea for all you fucking know half the time. It's just a horror show. You're just waiting to get picked off, basically. Oh, that's that, that sucks. Um, he had to have PTSD. Right. There's no way you don't have PTSD after that. I mean, I think I have PTSD <laughs> after listening to this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I should have known better. It was not going to end fucking... It, it was not going to end well. Um, and for a change, so yeah, I, didn't, guy, I didn't want to reveal the climax in the intro. Just just changing it around yeah, from my usual right. MO. Oh, you didn't include murder, death, and loss of friendship in the fucking intro? Awesome. Well, it's literally Sweet. called Killer from the Deep. So, I mean, some more astute listeners would probably have picked up on it quick. But, yeah. Uh, it's not right, the Nuzzler. I thought you were... Nuzzler from the trenches. I, I thought you were just being hyperbolic yeah, with it. I always so, am. No so that was deal. a fair assessment. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that maybe we can start off with here is we obviously have no way of fucking ever identifying this thing, whatever this thing is, whether it's a certain type of, uh, sea serpent or who knows that fucking field. I mean, so Bernard Hoofelman did wow. a breakdown with like, the long neck <clears throat> pinniped, the, the fucking giant sea turtle, the multiple flippered one. So there's right. ones you can kind of rule out that aren't official designations, like official zoological definitions, but yeah. there are listings sort of like close encounters, uh, by Hynek of potential, uh, you know, um, creatures that it can fit into a certain category. <clears throat> this seems to me, uh, just being exceedingly general to be a sea serpent. Yeah, in totally. That classic yeah. long neck sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that we're all on board with that. I don't think 100%. anyone can, strictly speaking, define it. I, 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 I think reptilian might be a fair bet based on the fact that it had a turtle-like head and teeth, but it would greenish with greenish brown, smooth skin. Even though some snakes appear to be smooth at a distance, but you notice their scales. Um, right then maybe it's amphibious but i yeah. i don't know I, I i guess i don't know my my assumption is reptilian and the fact that it had a dorsal fin would mean it's not just a super large sea snake right it is something else something that's equipped to you know live in the water um so yeah it's it's difficult to know i would say this i think we're all in agreement that um this is probably not something that was dropped off by a ufo uh, terrifying though it is, it's not an ultra terrestrial. Though if it was, it would be getting like the fucking Nobel Prize for ultra terrestrialing based on well, the state right. they left fucking Edward Bryan in. Um, exactly. So I mean, I suppose it could be some interdimensional thing, but I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm going back to where we were at just a couple of weeks ago with dinos. I think this is a straight up cryptozoological encounter. Uh, yeah i mean there's no reason to think otherwise i guess yeah i mean this thing is apparently the fucking jason Voorhees of the sea so yeah i mean <laughs> what, what, the so hockey mask what, what part about this makes it jason Voorhees? <laughs> just the unstoppableness <laughs> <laughs> just fucking stalks you well it's not and like they, it's not like they even under. tried to stop they didn't shoot him with a flare gun they did they already pissed their shark gun away <laughs> on fucking the old chris craft fucking yeah. so it's too bad if they had had it, maybe they could have impaled that thing and they all might have survived and had proof and are 
you know, zoological textbooks would have a different chapter, but instead everyone gets fucked and they're all kids. So that makes it super tragic, like 17 to, to 14 years old. I yeah, mean. no, that's fucking, that's just got awful. Um, So, so yeah, obviously, you know, a zoological creature, whatnot, uh, you know, again, I mean, if this, fucking poor dude went through this ordeal and it's just it's a matter of you know hypothermia and hallucinating and just being in a super fucking stressful time uh obviously um you know maybe he could have misidentified something but i don't i don't know yeah I mean, but how just, do you misidentify that that's what i'm trying to think yeah. of is like what would you see that's the, like, the I, thing i don't is, know anything that exists that that looks even remotely like that no, not well, at all. Well, the one thing I... the three of us and Brad knew is that it's not a fucking oarfish. <laughs> so that's right off the fucking dock. Probably docket. not. <laughs> I mean, I Probably hope not. not. <laughs> no, like... I mean, I, I got to agree with Chris 100%. I mean, there is, you, you're not confusing this. It's not like a rare form of quasi vertical shark. No, it right. super it has eel? to be a super eel. <laughs> it's super eel. Possibly yeah. a super eel. I mean, I guess you I mean, can't really, totally that's take it, right? that off the the menu and if it is it's great because again the things that live in the ocean and aren't identified aren't like in my mind magical ethereal <clears throat> things they're just unidentified species of animal that would probably fit into a branch of science already well known be it reptilian be it fish what what have you yeah uh, totally no, i'm i'm in complete agreement um so all right i mean ah, god this is just a bummer so yeah. his friends were killed his friends were killed by a sea serpent in florida and nobody believed him Fuck. and he lived in what a shame bummer. and madness and poverty i don't know about the last parts i hope not because i can see <laughs> wow. going uh, south. This in poverty see no. you next week <laughs> no I'm yeah kidding. really i mean uh thanks for listening <laughs> no i think that we're all we're all pretty much on i mean i think this actually again as tragic as it is um we're all in agreement that yeah this something attacked this guy because there really is no reason to fucking hoax it obviously if he didn't misconstrue something or you know whatever that's always a possibility but if you're going by what he says by the eyewitnesses words and what he experienced then yes his friends were single-handedly picked off by the fucking this creature in the fucking off the coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it's just fucking horrifying. The worst. Where do we go? Where do we go? The only Sweet thing that would justify. Where do we go? Oh, Jesus oh Christ. God damn it. <laughs> that would justify him lying about it <laughs> is if he murdered all of his friends and did so inconceivably in a way that involved maybe some preserved shark jaws. So it looked like they were bitten to death as they were killed. And then he jumped into the water and swam back to shore. And then on the off chance, any of them washed up, they would have bite marks and he would have this story to corroborate it. There is no when, other reason to lie that a sea monster attacked your friends. So when his well, when these bodies yeah. were recovered, what sort of damage was done to them? Does one, anybody body, know? one body. It was, it was, one body was, it was Brad and he was drowned. OK, so there was no but there so there was no bite marks. No, not on Brad. Okay. All right. Gotcha. So, oh man, this thing just fucking didn't even eat him. Just fucking took him down. And was like, "Fuck you. Good luck with the air. It's not gonna work." And then fucking done. Or he just it's, got he got ex, you know exhausted. Let's find out where. Right. I'm going through this story now. Brad was the one that shark gunned the boat. Got from him. He right. whimpered, "We're dead." He's the first one that thought he was dead, and then it was followed up by uh, Mr. McCleary. Uh, yeah. He had a date that night. That didn't work out so well. Sorry about that, Brad. Oh, no, goddamn fucking dude. Um, I was really hoping everyone was going to make it, man. I ain't going to lie. I guess it shows how much I fucking bone up on our episode. <laughs> so I'm like, Rob's going to tell me a story, and then it's not going to make me sad. Oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm sad. Thanks. Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Chris is still zero fucks to give. <laughs> no, I, I mean that's you know what are you what are no, you going to do at I this mean, point? It's essentially what I did. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It, it's it's fucking it's it's fucking it sucks. So so Chris, what do you think? What are you getting out of this? I don't know. I mean, other than some, like I said, a super eel, a gigantic ocean snake. No, oh, it's terrible. Like what the fuck? I mean, yeah. It's yeah, kind of what I was thinking too. I mean, 
even if it was, I'm, even if it's not something cryptozoological, even if it is just some sort of like a large sea eel, I mean, is that a thing? I'm assuming that's a thing, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, sea eels are a thing. <laughs> Right, but yeah. a large one. Has yeah, anyone ever I caught mean, a? I mean, eels every eel to me is large. Yeah, yeah every eel I've ever seen has been large. If it's over six feet, it's it's large to me. But if you're saying, are there seals that can rise up twelve feet out of the water and still have plenty left below? No, right, probably not, not. that we know. Okay, of. all right, all right, fair enough. Doesn't mean fair no enough. that they don't exist, but just no. Just in terms of like. Um, the the background on this thing uh here's here's a note also that i got from the crypto moon article and that is naturalist thomas helm allegedly encountered a long neck sea monster of some sort off fort walton beach florida near pensacola in 1943 but helm's creature was described as distinctly more mammalian than mccleary's reptilian beast so there's at least a history of sea serpent like uh, sightings, even though this thing might be a mammal in, in 43, um, off of this specific beach in Florida. So, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really corroborate it in any meaningful right. way, but at least it's interesting that there is a history uh, of it. So, you know, yeah. again, I think this is just a terrifying but clear-cut case of a predatory animal that maybe got washed because of the storm closer to shore than it ordinarily would hunt, though I don't know, like, what kind of uh, fish are in that area or were in that area at that time because with pollution and, and fucking all sorts of oil spills, who the fuck knows what's still there compared to what was there mm-hmm. in the 60s. But, uh, but you know, this thing might have just been doing its thing and been an opportunistic hunter and found these fucking kids and that was all she wrote. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, we're dealing with a fucking sea murder. So, yeah. Sea murder. I mean, <laughs> Jeez. Sea see, now sea I murder. wish I could retitle it. <laughs> the sea murder. I mean, it's, yeah, it's fucking... Oh, all right, man, what a bummer. Um, fucking stay out of the ocean, if, especially if you're near Florida. Fucking don't even buy. There, look, I've been to Florida. There's fucking pools everywhere. Just go in the pool. Yeah. Just fuck the ocean. I it's, say that, period. Anywhere you are, choose life. Choose clean water. Yeah, choose, choose chlorine. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Chlor- chlorine is your friend. So, all right. So there you have it. A tragic case of in cryptozoology. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Kryptonaut Podcast. Jesus wow, Christ. that ended fucking hard. Holy shit. Yeah. What a fucking downbeat bummer. Man, oh, I got some ZD to eat. So I know we're all gonna have. <laughs> let's have a ZD dinner in honor of the victims of the Pensacola serpent. Yeah, fuck, man. What a bummer. Um, So, yeah, I mean, again, I'm just going to read it. I'm going to repeat myself. I don't give a fuck. Stay out of the ocean. Trina, I'm talking to you. Stay out of the ocean. Do Thank it. You. I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, Safety first, so, motherfuckers. Uh, yeah. Kryptonaut Podcast. Uh, the Instas, the Twitters, and the Facebooks. Check us out there. Thank you all so very much for everyone that is in touch. Uh, Heller Space, HellerSpace.com. Get yourself some T-shirts. Um... Do we have any and sea coffee serpent mugs? And, no, uh, there's, no there's, we don't. This is the yeah, first sea serpent story I think we've ever done. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, have we completely for 130 some odd episodes neglected sea serpents? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I think Rightfully so. Rightfully so, because they're murderous fucks. Yeah, no doubt. They know. They we need don't want to give them place. the press. We don't want to give them the fucking press. Fuck yeah, em. but we have to warn the good people. I mean, we put the warnings out for ultra-terrestrials and other things. We have to warn the good it's people true. that the oceans are hate-mongering hellholes that want you to be totally. meat. You are the uh, meatiest of meats, and all it's going to do is eat you, so don't do not do it. And if you like to surf, com. find a wave pool. It's almost as cool. Not really, but still, you'll live longer. Patreon.com slash Podcast. Thank you to everybody over there that supports us. Gentlemen, closing thoughts, ideas, comments, questions, and suggestions. What do we got? Ha! Yeah, I think we made the suggestion pretty fucking clear. Um, yeah. Right. I, I, cool. Again, I, I think um, it's sad, but it's sort of like, you know, people say, you know, don't obliterate all sharks just because some people get attacked by sharks. They're just following their instincts. This is in all likelihood an animal simply following its instinct. And with, you know, supremely tragic results, especially for the families of those young men. But um, but in the end, you know, uh, I would still be fascinated to see uh, something like this found 
tagged, observed, watching documentaries galore, not just what if documentaries, but legitimate Smithsonian National Geographic fucking, uh, yeah. you know, Recre- not just recreations, but showing their day-to-day life. So, you know, let's not hate the sea serpent for doing what a sea serpent does. Let's fucking hate the game, not the player. That's that's so my you, last piece. All right, so are you saying take a shot at it or don't take a shot at it? I, if, I'm saying if, if, you're, if you <laughs> if or it's your attacking loved ones you, sure. are in jeopardy, yeah, or if Chris says it's attacking you, fuck, take, hopefully have a shark gun, aim for the eye. Do your best I mean, to live. We- are we gonna like red October this bitch or what? No, I'm not talking about. I'm t- well, I'm not endorsing the wholesale slaughter of all anomalous sea creatures, even no, if they happen to be predatory. Dude, the hunt for red October. It's a ship on ship battle. So we get our uh, own monster, uh, train it, and like Pokemon, force it to attack the evil ones. Yeah, yeah. Do we have style? torpedoes? Are you saying we should have torpedoes? Uh, well, what, when should we? Of course, we should have torpedoes. Why would we not have torpedoes? Yeah, how do you launch a torpedo from a raft? Well, we're gonna work on that. It'll you kick it. You're just gonna kick it toward the enemy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna kick it. You got it exactly. Uh, perfect. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Yeah, let's so do it. So we're gonna find out after this if we're using our Patreon money to Fucking buy a great. sub, kicking torpedoes, or if we're gonna use it to marine land train our own sea monster. No, we, no. Actually, we're using our Patreon money for Chris to get an electronic bike that I really want to talk to him about. So thank you all so very much for joining us, and we'll be talking to you soon. Goodbye. Stay safe, friends. Stay safe. <laughs> Enjoy that ZD because it's one day. Yeah, I know it's, it's gonna, one big fucking. It's gonna be you in the not ocean enjoying the ZD. <laughs> oh God, I, I I feel like quarantine might be getting to us. I feel like yeah, it. I think so too. No, nah, I, I just had one of those fucking it. days, man. And dude, I, dude, I'm telling you, I'm, I, I can tell you're having one of those days, 100%, but I was having one yeah. of those days, too, man. I had to talk to Uncle Bobby. I'd have a one-on-one time with Uncle Bobby, and it's like, man, yeah, I ain't going to yeah. lie. I'm fucking depressed as shit, and I don't even know why. I got two beautiful children and a beautiful wife, and I'm down here and talking about fucking yeah. people getting murdered by the sea. What the <laughs> fuck is wrong with me? I, what the I fuck know. is wrong with me? First off, that's not your fault. I brought the sea murder to the table. <laughs> That's so true. don't blame you. <laughs> Secondly, yes, you have a beautiful family and many things to be happy about, and we're all allowed to go through funks. It's okay. It'll get better. Third, Are you all just super depressed? What's no. going on? Okay, no, I mean, I'm, sure I'm, I'm all right. I mean, good. I'm keeping everyone I love is safe. Everyone is doing all right. I mean, yes, we're all stressed a little. It's been like a lot of no sleep and lots of. I got actually, I got a couple family members who are sick right now. Little babies and my and, and my mom's and my sister, but they're none of them are COVID sick, thank God, and they're all keeping yeah. their shit tight. So, but yes, as long as everyone's safe and happy, it's cool. But Mark, you have every right to be in a funk. Chris, you have every right to be apathetic. It is a lifestyle choice, and it is a circumstance. <laughs> I love you both the way you are, and we're going to get that, through this. That is true. Love you just the way you are. Da, 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 All right. Da, da, Thank da, you so da, very da. much, and we'll be talking to you soon. Bye. Oh, my Lord. That's a worse ending ever. <laughs> it's a <little> <laughs> Bye. Enjoy Bye. your fucking ZD. <laughs> wow. I don't, I don't care. I'm dead. Enjoy Ocean your ZD in honor of me. Now Chris is dead. <laughs> Oh, First God. Brad, then right. Edward Bryan, now Chris. Right, but you're going to find end. out you're not dead. Okay. Chris, Chris isn't dead. Spoiler alert. <laughs> he doesn't even care that he's I'll alive. accept that, right. too. Oh, Goodbye, it's a shit show. What are we doing? <laughs>